Hi, this is Amay from Dignitas. We were interested as an organization that's working quite closely with the Ministry of Health in Malawi. Um, we were interested to hear from Dr. Dybul how the 2014 to 16 strategy and the new funding model take into account um, the potential operational and resource implications of the anticipated WHO ART guideline revisions. Um, specifically for countries like Malawi, we were interested in hearing what kind of guidance they would receive on the feasibility uh, for different scenarios, including you know adopting higher CD4 thresholds or implementing test and, test and treat or treatment as prevention strategies. So we really appreciate a comment on that. Thank you. I, I haven't seen the, the guidance yet. It'll come out in June, and we're actually getting some briefings um, coming leading up to that. Um, but, you know, it seems pretty clear that recommended CD4 cell count will go up. Um, you know, these are tough issues, and treatment is prevention. Um, first of all, it, it's very clear to me that we cannot do test and treat on a national basis. It's, it's impossible. We can't do it financially, and, it, and we can't do it for what's necessary, which is massive mobilization uh, and huge community support for um, uh, getting people in for testing, for getting them into treatment, for keeping them into treatment. Um, that's why I think looking at where the new infections are occurring, and you know, when you look at a country, and we're doing some of this, and we will support this in the in the new funding model. If you look at the epidemiology, you see very small geographic hot zones where incidence can be five, six, ten times what it is in the rest of the country. Those are places where test and treat um, seem something that's possible. Pre-exposure prophylaxis could be possible there. Um, because you'd have the financial resources, but also the human resources to make it work and to implement it. Um, countries will have to decide, as they did when the CD4 cell count went from 2 to 350, the pace at which they'll do that, when they'll do that, and why they'll do it. Um, and uh, look at the benefits in terms of um, um, benefit to individual patients um, uh, relative to scale up of, uh, for those who really need in the financial constraints. Um, one of the last things you want to do is uh, not have resources available when people come in with 50 CD4 cells uh, because they'll die in a year if you don't treat them. Um, and if you're treating people at much higher CD4 cell counts and don't have resources at, for, for the people who, who have low CD4 cells, then, then you're going to run into considerable problems. So we're a country-owned program. We don't believe in telling countries how to manage those things. They need to look at the recommendations. They need to look at why the recommendations were made. Their resource envelopes, and then you know make decisions on how they want to proceed. Um, uh, we also have TB and malaria to deal with. Um, everything is done within guidance, of course. We're not a technical agency, and we're not a, a guidance agency. But countries are pretty savvy and need to make decisions on their own in terms of what they're going to pursue. How does the global fund plan to evaluate the learnings of the very very early applicants, the three applicants? And I think that also what's the flexibility to change some of the elements of the new funding model based on those learning for the rollout of the new funding model, particularly the role of the CCMs. If you look at you know, the EHERN experience doing a regional proposal that it, you know, may be quite successful, you know, what is the plan to support others moving in that direction? So one of the things about the new funding models, the CCM is no longer the be-all and end-all of the global fund, and the country dialogue doesn't need to, and in fact hasn't occurred through the CCM. It's been much broader than the CCM. Um, the CCM still has to submit the proposal, and the CCM exists in the bylaws of the global fund. Um, so, um, but how we use CCM is very different. Um, uh, for example, in IHP plus countries, we can use IHP plus as a mechanism. But one thing's clear, the right people have to be at the table for the country dialogue, and if they're not part of the CCM, then it doesn't, then they need to be brought in. And that's actually happened in Myanmar and Zimbabwe and El Salvador. So, so far that seems to be working. The regional proposals, um, we don't need a regional CCM, we don't think, although we're still looking at the policy implications of that. Um, and it is clear that we need to have additional funding. We can't do regional proposals where it's just coming from the, re from the country budgets because there's not much incentive to engage. So, but well, we're actually going to have a formal look at what's, what happened in the, in the early applicants. 
um, towards the end of this year, and then from that we'll make adjustments. We're also making real-time adjustments based on what's happening in, early in the countries and welcome feedback um, informally through the portfolio managers, through um, our team, and uh, that there's a transition team in, for the new funding model in, in Geneva through them, through your contacts um, in the country or in Geneva. We're very much open to what's working, what's not working. Uh, but would, there will be a formal look at it um, uh, towards the end of the year so that we can make the adjustments we need going into the, the full round of the new funding model. What is the Global Fund plan, um, as in the Secretariat plan, in terms of advocating with the board of allocating funding for community system strengthening um, down the road in the full rollout of the new funding model? Because at the moment, we know that there is no allocated formula for the community system strengthening. Uh, whereas health system strengthening um, um, has, has one. And, and I'm really interested in your view on that, whether or not that's something is a possibility. And I know that, um, that the committee system strengthening is allowed to uh, roll into the reduced proposals, but I'm also talking about cross-cutting community system strengthening proposals for which there is no allocated funding as far as I know. Thank you. Um, well, there really isn't an allocated amount for health system strengthening either. There, in the new funding model, each country gets one allocation across the three diseases, um, including health system strengthening and anything else that needs to be done to achieve the objective. So it's a little bit like the test and treat in 500 question. I mean, countries need to look at how they're going to get to controlling their epidemics, providing a basal level of care and treatment uh, for the three diseases. Um, and how they want to allocate their amount. We don't. We're, we don't set that from from um, from Geneva. The only thing where there'll be a set allocation, possibly, and the committee, the board has not decided this, is if, is if there'll be a disease allocation um, uh, um, by disease, and whether or not they'll be global or how it will be done is still a very open question with the board. But there isn't a set aside for health system strengthening. That's up to the countries, and be the same for community. It's basically how do you get to the goal, and what's what's the role of the global fund to get to that goal? What are others funding? That's really what the new funding model is, is meant to address. So we're trying to get away from set allocations and set asides because that's kind of predetermining and creating a one size fits all that doesn't really exist, um, and and we don't believe is the right model. Uh, my next question is on the. Uh, the resources that INGOs uh, or uh, CSOs involved as co-peer are putting into Global Fund, uh, it doesn't seem to be captured into the system. So for example, if I take a, a, a country like Liberia, uh, a few months ago we saw communication around um, filling out a form that indicates how much uh, contribution into uh, Global Fund grants came from other organizations. And then uh, when we started the conversation with the FPN, we learned that it's not from INGOs. They're looking for other contributions from other bilaterals. So uh, what, what do you have in place or thinking to have in place to capture that? Because most of the INGOs invest a lot into the process. And also when there are gaps, particularly since uh, 2008 when uh, Global Fund started having the 10% reduction on all the approved budgets. So there are always gaps. When the grant is approved, then you get into recruitment of the ASRs, you realize there are gaps, and you have to get the fund uh, from different sources, and particularly INGOs. Plan has been putting a lot of fund, I mean millions of dollars, into a number of countries. But we, we don't, it's not captured somewhere. Is there anything that could be done on that particular aspect? I, I don't know. I think uh, we'd have to think about that. The last thing we want to do is impose reporting burdens on people that don't um, that don't have time or effort ability to do that. Which means we have to we have to not only collect it but verify it, um, uh, and you all have to collect it and verify it. And that's a big uh, burden, unless we're talking about across the board large enough sums of money that's going to matter. And the reason we're doing that is so we can go back to the donors and say it's not just you. The countries are increasing their contributions. They're doing all this. You would have to be in the tens of millions or higher range, much higher range. To you know, We're not doing it so that we um, 
uh, so that we know we're doing we're collecting those data because it's essential for fundraising because increased domestic contributions really matter. Now, if the numbers are high enough, then it would justify that and can be part of the public-private partnership, but they have to be awfully high. So I think we should um, sit down with um, our partnership group, which Sven can you know, bring back to them, or I can bring back to them, to see if we can explore this. I'm just reluctant to begin asking partners who are already doing a lot of work to collect that information, verify it, then we have to collect it and verify it. We have to, be, we have, to have a sense that it's awfully large um, to matter. Um, to matter in the sense that it would shifting, it would have to shift either our ability to raise funds or shift our ability to, uh, our, our, how we would direct funds. Um, so we'd have to think about it. Uh, but it's a, it's a good point. That's a very good point. I mean, if, the, if there's a reason to do it, we should do it, but we just need to be conscious of your costs and our costs to the cost that it would, would be involved in that, um, the transaction cost. But it might be very valuable in terms of showing contributions um, uh, beyond the traditional donor route. How would the learning from the NFM be built into the phase two renewal? That's the first question. So we're actually um, uh, rolling all renewals um, into the same approvals committee, so there aren't multiple committees anymore, there's only one, the grant approval committee. Um, that um, Because we're in a transition from the <coughs> existing grant structure to the new funding model. But the same type of approach we've been talking about is act, we're actually redoing the, the cover sheets, basically, the, the scorecard, um, to reflect um, what's happening in a country in terms of the epidemic, what are you doing, where are your gaps. You know, the past renewals were, you couldn't tell what was happening in the country. It was, our goal was 3,000 people, and now it's 4,000. And you had no idea what that was in terms of gap. You had no idea if key populations were being reached. So we're restructuring everything to, um, what, where are we with the epidemic? What is being done on, with renewal? And what's the global fund doing? What are others doing? What's the gap? Uh, are we addressing what needs to be addressed? So that whole process is changing. We're also encouraging countries in renewal to um, consolidate all the grants as we're going to do in new, the new funding model so that it's not multiple spigots going into the same um, pool, but it's seen as a cohes cohesive whole. And, in fact, Tanzania and their ma malaria submission for renewals did uh, pull together all of their existing malaria grants and reprogrammed everything. So that's what we're encouraging countries to do as we transition. The reality is by the end of next year, it's going to be irrelevant because everything's going to move through the new funding model. But for now, we're trying to you know, encourage a shift in this transition to the new funding model. The same thing's true of the interim countries where we're basically doing top-ups uh, to countries uh, that weren't going through the full new funding model. 